in Genesis, everything, you know, starts from Genesis. You want to be a strong Christian, you want to be a strong believer, you need to read the book of Genesis. Why? Because in the beginning, God. Alright? So when people ask you, why do you believe? I said, I, God. I believe God did it. I said, God God created it. God did it. I have no doubt in that. I mean, how else? Scientists have been trying to explain this whole thing for years. They've created so many different things. And, and uh, people have gotten their doctor trying to prove evolution. It just kind of drives me crazy to think about an untruth, and now you have a doctorate on it. It's just a bit of craziness. But that's fine. That's the world education system. Fine. Study it out. Learn it. Do what they can. You know, things do evolve, I think, to some extent. Micro, uh, if you will, at a macro sense. Uh, I think that's true. But in the big sense, I don't... I just love this cartoon I used to have. I know I can tell you a story, but I used to there was a cartoon, and it was like an uh, island, and then there were these fish looking at the island, and they're looking like, hey, you know, maybe we can walk on the island, right? So then it shows the fish jumping onto the island, and the next cartoon shows it's, it's a, it was a tropical island, so it had a palm tree, and then the next the next picture showed the the, the fish bones. You know, they didn't evolve. They just kind of jumped on the island and that was it. You know, so it's like, hey, okay, that's, that's pretty simple to me. But uh, anyway, the, the reason I said God, God, oh, let me just, that was, I don't know why I said, went there. But anyway, God is the creator of all the world. Amen? Amen. And um, he loves you and he loves me. And I want to prove to you today about that great love. Amen? I want to show you today that love comes with a price and it costs us something too. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. It, it, it's gonna. It's a, it's something that's deep in us. You know, it's not just something we can surfacely try to do this thing called Christianity. We can't. It's not on the surface. You can't kind of pretend this thing. Mm -hmm. It's much deeper. It's eternal. It's it's something that's gonna cause you to sacrifice what you have in your own will to do the very will of God. It's, you give up everything to do what you want for the kingdom of God, and so it has to be more. How can those disciples follow Jesus all those years, those three years, give up everything, all their wealth, if you will, all their, their job, their, 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 uh, their, uh, their future, because I'm going to follow this man because he was telling truth and God revealed to them this truth. And so as they grew in relationship with this Jesus, this teacher, this rabbi, they begin to realize that there's something deeper than what happened. Something awakened in their spirit. They begin to understand. They begin to realize. And then they begin to fall in love with this man. And then <coughs> at the end, Peter said, I'll die for you. So I want to pick this story up, if you will, in John chapter 13. Is right before he was going on to be crucified. Is right before he was arrested. Right before... Um, it was great when he washed the feet of his disciples. You remember Je uh, John chapter 13. Let's go there. John 13. And I'm going to be teaching out of 31 through 35, but I'm going to just get, build it up to that so we remember what was happening. Jesus, knowing this was the last Passover meal that he was going to celebrate with his disciples on earth. They had all the fixings. They, were, they, were, they got ready, and as they got ready for this meal, Jesus comes in. And he takes and puts a towel around himself, and he got a basin of water, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. You guys remember the story, right? And and he got around to washing their feet. He got to Peter. Peter's like, "Wait, why? Don't wash my feet, Lord." He's, and he questioned his where he's at again about his commitment, about his love for Jesus. He said, "You got, you got. I have to wash your feet if you want to live forever." And he says, okay, God, well, then wash my whole body. No, no, that's not the point. Jesus was making, what Jesus was showing them is that they're going to have to be a servant to each other. That was the point of that washing the feet. It wasn't about lording over. It was about ruling over. It wasn't about making some religious foundation. It wasn't about anything, but that the message that he was going to put in them through the Holy Spirit, he was going to, he was going to, uh, uh, in, in they'll see in just a short time, they'll be empowered to do this work, but they're going to have to be servants. They have to be humble. They have to work to do and serve so this message of love will spread through the whole world. Amen? Because otherwise, the authority and everything that they did, now think about that. They walked through. You see later on that Peter walked down the road. People's heat, by a shadow alone, people were healed. Right? So you're going to, I mean, people are going to run to you and flock to you. Oh, you must be a God, right? And they, no, no, no. Everything that you see that's happening here is 
done because Jesus demanded you crucified. That's how this is happening, right? So Jesus is telling this story. Then he goes, let's pick it up at verse 18. This is, I am, I am not, this is right before the betrayal. Now, now that now that you washed your feet, now there's a betrayal that's going to happen. He's going to reveal who was going to betray him. It's in verse 18. It says, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the scriptures. He who shares my bread, he lift up his heel against me. He will lift up his heel against me. Now, I, I went back and referenced that. Do you know in Genesis chapter 3, the same thing is in there? Uh, could you do that? With, could you turn there with me? To I want to show you this heel here that is going to hit Jesus. Right? He's gonna this he's gonna bruise Jesus' heel and Jesus was gonna crush his head, right? Okay, so this is a prophecy, or this was the word that God told to the fallen man. When man sinned, when man when they took a ate of that tree and, and Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered the world. Now Jesus was God was telling them what was gonna happen in verse 13, Genesis 3 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this. Now who's the serpent? The devil. The devil. Satan, right. The enemy. The devil. That's what Satan is referred to in the Bible as, 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 as the snake, or the devil, or the Satan. Okay? So he says, Cursed are you above all the livestock, all the animals, wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. So enemy right now, since this time, the devil, think about everything, how bad the devil is, he's dirt. He's eating dirt. Now think about that. That's why he's so mad, I guess. Uh, I don't like to eat dirt. And I will put enmity, uh, enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Who's, who's the woman here? Who's the woman here? Eve. And is prophetic word, so what else, who else would this refer to? Uh, the church, yeah, and who else? Come on, Mary. Who's going to have the baby? Mary. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dion. Yeah. And between you and the woman, and, and between your offspring and hers, meaning the church too, he will crush your, he will, Jesus will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 13. I mean John, sorry. 13. And it says, And he and he'll lift up his heel against me. Prophetic word coming to pass right now. It's coming to pass. Genesis, when God told Adam and Eve what was going to happen and the snake, now it's about to happen. Okay, it's going to be fulfilled. This this prophecy, this word, this truth is now going to be fulfilled right here, right now. It says, I'm telling you now before it happens, so that even when it does happen, you will believe that I am He, who? Jesus, the Christ. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone, I said, accept me, and whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. So, Jesus said, don't accept anybody except for me. There's no other word out there. There's no other truth out there except for Jesus. Don't accept them. But if you accept me, you accept the one who sent me. And who is that? God the Father. You accept me, you accept God the Father. The one who prophesied, the one who told us the truth back here in Genesis, the one who created Adam and Eve, that's who we accept. So we say, I want to have love for people. Where do you get the love for people? From the Father. True love comes from the Father. How can I love people? How can I love one another? How can we have a church that's so diversified? How can we do that? Because we love one another. And we'll fight for each other. We'll die for each other. We'll pray for each other. We'll encourage each other. We'll lift each other up. Amen? Because the enemy doesn't want that. He wants us down in the dirt with him. Eating dirt. We think it's fun. The world thinks it's fun. But it's dirt. I won't get off on that. Let me stand track. And verse 21, And after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And John is writing this. Now remember, John, the disciple that loved Jesus, when you write about, he, in his book, the book of John, think about John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God 
John loved Jesus. John, over the three years that they were together, learned to love this man, knew that he was the Son of God, and there was something about the love of the Father that, that John received. He wasn't like Peter or me, because kind of, we're kind of vocal, you know. Peter's out there, you know, I'll die for you. He pulls out a sword and cuts off a servant's ear, you hear in a, in a little bit. We'll see that. You know, I, I'm kind of like that guy. I'm like Peter. You know, bull in a china factory, if you will, china shop. I kind of just want to go through and, you know, hit sin, 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 get saved, get saved. You know, I'm but John wasn't like that. God's changing my heart a little bit. Let me tell you what he's doing to me, okay? John, I, I, I want to be that other person, but God's kind of, maybe I'm starting to be more like John. Maybe I won't just sit at Jesus' feet a little bit longer. Maybe this week of recovery, because I want to get out and do stuff, get the snowblower going, get this going, get my grass cut, get everything ready for I couldn't do none of that. I sat in my chair. Tina's working upstairs because she works from home. And I just listened. You know, maybe I need to learn to love like John loved God so much. Maybe I need to learn to love more and just demonstrate that love even greater. You know, so I think God's kind of taken my heart and changed it a little bit. Amen? And G John was this person that just loved everything that Jesus did. And he, he began to listen to the words that Jesus was speaking at this time. And look what happens next. Says, After he had said this, he recognized that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He was, close, he was the one reclining next to Jesus at the Last Supper, if you will. They were they, they're at a table that was on the ground. They are laying on pillows, if you will. And Jesus, John was the one that was next to Jesus. And he noticed in Jesus' character something changed right there. Something changed. It, 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 drew, it drew his attention. That's why he wrote this. And, he began to, and Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, one of you are going to betray me. So now... What was, gonna, what was prophesied is now going to be fulfilled. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he, he meant. One of them, the disciples whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, John, and, uh, reclining next to him, which is John speaking. Simon Peter motioned to the disciples and said, Ask him which, what he means. So you think about it. There was Jesus, there was John, and maybe Peter was right here. And Peter's like, Hey, John. What is he saying? What is, what, tell me, ask him, ask him what he means. And then leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? John, John got it, Peter didn't get it. That's kind of always what happens. You know, John says, I, John figured it out, but Peter still got figured out. Then it says, it, it is the one whom I will give this piece of bread, and I dip it into this dish, or he dipped it into the, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe dipped it in olive oil. You know, you've ever been to an Italian restaurant, right? You know, <laughs> or, you know whatever, I don't know. Uh, but he dipped it, uh, maybe they dipped it into the wine, representing the new covenant. He gave it to him, right? D dipping in a piece of bread, he, he gave to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, Simeon. As soon as Judas took the bread, uh, Satan entered him. So at this point, now think about this. He had a fulfill, he had a go against everything that God was doing. And then Saint entered him because he, he sin came to him, but until he actually was going to fulfill it, then he then the sin he was tempted, but then the sin happened. Amen. How we get tempted? How we get tempted? Did we get tempted to do things wrong? Yeah, we all get tempted until we do it. That's you know the sin. We can resist it up to that point. What you are about to do, do do quickly. Jesus told him, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Jesus had, and was charged the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to go buy what was needed for the feast, or to give some money to the poor. As soon as Jesus had taken the bread, he went out, and it was it was nighttime. Now this is what I want to talk about. This is my, the, what I want to teach you, uh, teach about this next section. Um, it says, when he was gone, Jesus said, now I'm going to read this. Let me just read through this, and then I'm going to explain it a little bit, and then we're going to go into the first John. It says, when he was gone, Jesus said this, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Now. He said, now, this is the beginning of my glorification. All right? 
And God is glorified in him. God is going to be glorified. God the Father is going to be glorified in what I do. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. So at once, God, Jesus knew the mission. He knew the purpose he was there for, and he was going to fulfill that without a doubt. He's confessing it to his disciples. My children, he says. This is so powerful, this word, my children. Look it up someday. Look it up in the original. He's saying, he's saying that to you. He says, when he says children, he's saying the same thing. He's, he's saying, this is not Jesus speaking at this moment. This is God the Father going through Jesus at this moment. He's saying, my children, I will be with you only for a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I have told the Jews, I will tell you now, when I, where I'm going, you cannot come. And look at verse 34. This is so powerful. Remember, this, this is an intimate moment. Think about the moment. Jesus is sitting at the Last Supper. He just, the accuser, if you will, the one that's going to deceive him, he just revealed. And now he knows what's going to happen next. We see the Garden of Gethsemane. We know he's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten, flogged, put on the cross. All that's going to happen next. At this moment, at this intimate moment, this, he goes, I'm going to tell you some deep truth. We can't take this lightly. I read this over and over and over this week. I said, God, this is so powerful. How do, we, how do I miss this? How do I not understand how great your love is for me? And he says this. He goes, where I'm going, you can't go. Verse 34, a new commandment. Now, what is this word commandment? It's like a new covenant, right? Remember the Old Covenant? Everybody understands it. The Jewish people had to sacrifice animals for their sin. Once a year, they had a, they, the high priest had to go into the temple and, and sprinkle the blood of that animal onto the, uh, the, 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 uh, the altar, the mercy seat, and the, for, the sins of that nation would be forgiven. He, that's gone now. Because now Jesus is once and for all going to do that for us. He's going to take his own blood. He's going to take it to the temple that's in heaven and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And the sins of the world will be forgiven forever. And all you have to do is believe that. Amen? All we have to do is believe that. And he says, this is a new commandment. I give you, and it, what, look, what, is, what does it say in your Bible? Love one another. He didn't say, I want people to be Jewish. He didn't want to say people have to be Roman Catholic. He didn't tell people that to do it. He just telling people, love one one another. As I have loved you, so that you must love one another. Look at the verse. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Then Peter goes on to talk about where ask where he's going after that. But Jesus said, listen, what happens? What's the greatest commandment that God gave? Remember, Jesus said, you have all these commandments. Uh, you talk to some Jewish scholars, they can give you every 500 or 625 of them or whatever they are. You know, they got the Ten Commandments, you got all the laws and all that stuff. Jesus said, no. All you have to do is love one another. And Jesus said this way, he simplified it. He said, if you would, he said to the, 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 the religious folk, if you would love God while your heart, mind, body, and soul, and if you love one another, you fulfill all the law. You fulfill all the rules. You won't do wrong, if you will. You, you won't be tempted. You, you'll be tempted. We won't yield to sin if you would love one another. How powerful is that? I'm thinking like, okay, God, do I love everyone? I have to do some self-examination. If I'm going to preach that, I've got to like look at myself. Do I love everybody? Do I demonstrate that love? Well... Uh, like most of you, I probably fall short. Huh? Come on. Yes? Right? We kind of like, not, you know, I'm, I'm working on it, God. And being in the United States, we think, oh my goodness, we got this perfect country, right? There's more hatred going on in this country than in the whole world. It's, it's ridiculous. Amen. Huh? Where's the, where's the Christian church? Where's the church standing up and loving and breaking down those walls that we put up in our country for so long? What, where's the love? Where's the true church? Right? The church is not the building or denomination. I've told that many, many times. Where it is us as people. It's not ministries. It's not, it's not, we're all children of God. We meet here today because we're a family here. That's fine. 
But let's not exclude any other family that's worshiping the true God. Amen? We're all one family doing the same work for the kingdom of God. Amen? That's the way it is. Uh, and you'll never hear me say, this uh, capital C church, we got it all together. We got all the answers. You've got to follow us and that's it. You know, our doctrine, that's the way to go. That's, that's life and hell. Why? Because it divides the believer. It divides the believer. I'm tired of, uh, let's, I'm just going to go there this morning. I'm tired of race being separated in Christianity. People being separated by race in Christianity. Why can't black, white, purple, pink, Asian, Russian, whatever you are, come together and worship God? What's our identity? Where, where's our citizenship? Come on, don't be so quiet on me, right? Who's our citizenship? Who, who is our leader? Who is our king? Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So we need to love one another as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So this word, my children, it, it got me going. I was like taught reading this and, and, and going and doing some research and then it brought me to go to first job. Now, how many, when's the last time you read First John? Again, this is a disciple that loved Jesus. So the word love in this book is so many, so many times, you know, it's just so many uh, times. But there's such a great depth of warning for the believer in this, in this book, too. Peter come before John in the New Testament. They were the bold Peter and then the John that's going to say, okay, I know Peter told you, but let me just lay it out more in a loving, kind, shepherding way for you, okay? So this is what I want to do this morning. Tina's going to help me, and I'm, we're going to read the whole book of First John together. All right? We're going to read. Now, this, instead of preaching and telling you about it, I got a, a couple verses I want to amplify a little bit, but for the most part, we're just going to read First John. Now, she's going to read out of the NIV Bible, right? Yes, Tina. Yes. All right? And um, you can, if you have a different version, that's fine. Just follow along. And if you got your iPhones out, break out your iPhones. You got your phone, get your Bible out. You get your Bible out, yeah. You got the Bible app on there? All right, get it out. And uh, go to First John. There's a reason for this. I was sitting in my chair, I was a big chair. Reggie brought me this uh, really nice um, uh, heating pad kind of thing. It's full body length, so it fit my whole chair, so I can put, it vibrates up here by my neck, and it vibrates in my back, and it vibrates on my thing, and then each one I would heat it up too, so it was like, it was, it was great, you know, it worked, it would help my, loosen my back up, and uh, as I was sitting there, and I was just reading uh, this this book over and over, and oh, I just read, and the more it got in my spirit, I said, oh, you know, I'm going to change church service, I'm going to end church service with this today, I want to read this, and I want you to just Try not to let your mind wander right now, okay? Let the Word refresh your mind. That's what the Word of God does. It renews our mind, right? It changes our thinking. It helps a little bit. So let the Word just get into your spirit and let that soak it. Just soak it up, okay? As Tina reads, and then we'll just, I'll just stop at a couple verses I want to amplify a little bit. But I don't want to, um, I want to do it like John did. I'm going to say some things, but I want you to, uh, as a loving father does, okay? Okay, you're not quite doing this right, honey. Let me, let's, let's change this, okay? And uh, that's what John did. He says in, in one of the verses, he talks about lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. It's here for John. Like, oh, so that's a warning. John was like saying, okay, you need to love, but don't forget, don't, these things are going to come after you. Satan's still going to be that, that dirty snake in the dirt trying to trip you up. But we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We're overcomers of all the vices that he's given us. Amen? All right. You ready? Okay. So, all right. Verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. 
so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if Stop anybody a does... Stop a second. So why would John write this book? Right. And he, who is he writing it to? He's writing it to the new church, the new developing church. So the, the, the message doesn't change. He's writing it to us so we can avoid sin. So it's, this is an important thing, right? Because we don't want to walk in sin. We want to walk in righteousness and light. Love. Go ahead, Tina. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, <coughs> the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining if anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you fathers, because you know who, you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. 
They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But now you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. So who is a liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, listen to that. The lying, the lying religions are those that do not believe that Jesus Christ came from the Amen. Yeah. All right? So when you're talking to people and they try to lead you to a, to a different, this is how you verify, we'll talk about this, we'll see it again here in scripture, that those religions that take you away from Jesus is not a true religion. All right? It's, it's, there's so many deceiving things out there. You have to be aware that how do you measure what's right is through the word of God. Amen? So you have to know the word. Go ahead. Who is a liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Amen. We're going to do verse chapter 3. I'll spoil going to do all of them. But think about this last part. Jesus is coming back. And if he, this is what I like when I read this, I think, okay, if Jesus came back right at this moment, he appeared in this room with us. Would we be embarrassed? Would we like, oh, we could have done more? Or, oh, I hope he doesn't know about this thing in my life. Right? I hope he doesn't reveal, that. I hope he doesn't show everybody what, how really I really am. Amen? And that's where I had to deal with this week. I had to look at thinking, like, hey, if Jesus was standing at my chair where I was hurting, and he would show me who I really am. He would, he would, if we appeared here today, would we, well, how, would we hide underneath the chair? Well, we, what would we do? Would we bow in his presence? Would we stand up and awe him? I just hope we just, we're not embarrassed. We're not ashamed. We, he just says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's why John is writing this, and, and he, he, he repeats these things. It seems like he repeats himself, but he's doing it because he's doing it gently. My children, my children, God loves you. He loves you. You're, in, you're the only hope for the world. You're the only light for the world. If you just, my children, listen, don't be like the world. Let that love shine through you so the world will know me. Go ahead. Chapter See what, 3. Chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. 
In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. And where does the seed come from? God's seed comes from. God's seed is in them. In Genesis, it says the seed, right? So that, that seed is a prophetic word. That seed is Jesus. And Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Right? The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she became pregnant and had baby Jesus, right? So that seed is that is planted in you now as a believer. Christ by his spirit is in you. Hallelujah. The seed is planted in you. Hallelujah. It will grow in you. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are, and our aunt, God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possession and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we have set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak 
from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. God, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God, does not love, does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God, the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. So there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do to, to, with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfectly in love. So if you if you have fear, then you have to realize like, why where is the fear coming from? And it's coming from the enemy to cause you to doubt God. That's where fear comes from. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. What's going to happen? I'm all worried. All that stuff, that's for me. God has your back if we love him. God has your back. He knows your future. He knows the plans he's prepared for you. He knows all those things. So we have to be careful not to let fear come in. Because fear is the opposite of love. And love casts out the fear. Out of all the fear. Go ahead, David. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Say that again. And, and his, his commands, commands are, are not burdensome. burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world this is the victory that we overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Question mark. Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Only he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Go ahead, Tina. Verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, 
but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. Amen. And this life is in his Son. Yes. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that, that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he knows, what, and, and we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So John finishes it up with keep yourself from idols. We have plenty of idols today. But I want you to go back to the, one of the most misused verses in this Bible, in this passage, is right before in verse 13. Go back to verse 13. I write these things to you who believe, and I'll end with this, in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So God, Paul, uh, John is writing these so we can have eternal life. How do we have eternal life? We confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? And we abstain from sin. And that's what he's saying over and over. The message is this. There's no other gospel message that we have to say to people to be saved. There's no other thing that we can tell people is this is the message. God loves you. He sent his son to die for your sins, and you don't have to walk in that sin anymore because it was defeated on the cross. And if you accept that and love God and obey him, you're, you're good to go. So you know, look at the next, now in that context, think about the next verses. This is the confidence that we have approaching God. Now here we are, a sinner. We're going to approach God. Is that if we ask anything in his will, he will hear us. We use that verse all the time for stuff that we want. But really what it's talking about is when you recognize that you're a sinner, we can approach God and ask Him to forgive us of anything, and He'll do That's what this means right here. We take that into context. We take that one verse, and we have a doctrine, and we say, ask anything in God's will, and He'll do it for you. But what He's referring to, look what He refers to right here. He sandwiches it in between the first part and the last part. He's talking about God's love. He's talking about forgiveness. He's talking about obedience to God's commands. He's not talking about ask, praying for a Cadillac or something. He's just saying, you know what I'm saying? As we get to, we pull this one verse, but you take it in context. As we end this morning, I want to just look at that. Ask anything. What do you need to be forgiven for this morning? What is the Holy, as Tina was reading, what was the Holy Spirit telling you as you're going through those verses? Pride of lies, lust of the flesh, being obedient to God. Anytime I do something that's contrary to God, it's a sin. That's what he was writing it gently. Hey, God loves you, but if you do this, it's a sin. God loves you, but if you act like this, it's a sin. He's over and over in this passage. He's just trying to remind you, God loves you. Come to the throne. Jesus, when he 
rip that curtain in the temple from top to bottom. Now we have access into the very throne room of God. We can go into his presence now and say anything, anything, and he'll forgive us. Come on, everyone in the room, just bow your heads, would you? Would you just ask the Lord? I mean, he's being gentle this morning. He's reminding us of his great love. He sent Jesus. He sent him to do all the work for us. He sent him to forgive you of everything, anything that you've ever done, even the doubts and fears that you might have even for right now. God, he's talking to you. He, said, he called you children in here. He called you brothers and sisters. He called you the beloved. He called you the loved ones. He loves you. He loves you. But he wants to take away your sins. If you have any sin, if you have any fear, if you have any doubt, he wants to forgive you. And just ask him right where you're at to say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Help me to be obedient to your commands. Help me to love one another as you love us. We know that everyone born of God, everyone born of God, does not continue to sin, as it says in verse 18. Help me, God, not to sin. Ask him that right now, right where you're at. Ask him, help me not to judge people. Help me to love those that are different than myself. Help me to reach out and be your hand and step in the world. Lord, help me to love. It says here, if you see a brother in need or a sister in need, and you have means, you should help them. Or help me be open to give. Let me be a giver. Let me be a giver. So those brothers and sisters that have need, that we can provide for them. And I think it's really interesting how Paul ended this chapter chapter 5 with keep me from idols. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. I don't know what your idols are in your life right now. It could be money, it could be your TV set, your car, your home, the things that you try to get to make yourself successful. Lord, help me not to be that idol. Let you be the Lord and King of my life. Let you be the one that my focus is. Let me have dove eyes, as that one song Tina was saying. Remember that song? Uh, dumb eyes. Let me have single this and purpose that my eyes are focused on you, that your love will flow through me to the world around me. Father, you see every person in this room right now. God, you know what we struggle with. We know what we're, uh, we, how we've overcome so many things, but God, we still feel like unworthy at times. But God, you said we should have joy. So, Father, even though we recognize that maybe things aren't perfect in our lives, God, I pray you restore the joy of our salvation. That you took these sins away and you washed us clean, and now we are called your children. And even though the world may hate us, God, we're still going to serve you. Even though the world may mock us and make fun of us, God, oh, you are our King and our Lord, and we'll not, we'll, we'll not bow to any other except for you. Father, I pray your power through your Spirit for each person that's in this room. For you sent your Holy Spirit to lead us in all truth and give us the power we need to be your witnesses. So, Father, I pray your power over each person right now. Fill them with your spirit, the deposit you put in them, that spirit, God, let it grow. And I thank you for that. Father, bless your children. Let your face shine upon them, Lord God. God, give them peace. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just stand right now. Hallelujah. Stand in His presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word this morning, God. Let it penetrate our hearts and our minds. Let it change our character, Lord. Let us be like you, God. Oh, Father, we thank you so much. Thank you so much.